Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. It is a beautiful sunny afternoon down here in the south of England. I hope the sun is shining and it's beautiful and warm where you are. We are very lucky to be joined this afternoon by director Matthew Zia, um, who has worked uh, on so many different incredible productions and with so many different theatres, including Manchester Royal Exchange, uh, Orange Tree, Every Man and Playhouse, uh, Theatre Royal Stratford East and uh, many more. So we are very lucky to be joined by him to talk all things uh, directing and about the industry. Hi, Matthew, how are you doing? I'm very good, Rosie. Thanks for having me on. Good. Uh, so what have you been up to? Uh, I mean, that's a very I've wide been... question. It's like, what have you been doing for six months since lockdown? But yeah. um, how have you been? Uh, gosh, it's always hard to answer that, like mm. truthfully, uh, whilst, whilst remaining upbeat and positive. Uh, <laughs> At this moment in time, the sun's shining, I am feeling very upbeat and positive. I've spent the last two weeks making a piece of work, uh, not with the company that I run, but with Theatre Royal Stratford East and the Greenwich and Docklands International Festival, which happened outside. And we had real audiences and a rehearsal room with hand sanitizer in every corner and <laughs> masks. And look, I've got, I've got this souvenir face shield from rehearsals that I was uh, wearing. So like working out how to try and motor forwards, I guess, but to go back six months um, mm. where I was about to launch our first tour for the company ATC Actors Touring Company. Uh, we just opened in Plymouth. We'd done a, a wonderful two week run. We would kind of put it to bed for about two weeks before getting ready to remount it uh, on a, I think it was a nine week tour, uh, which was wow. take all across the country to, to Wales, to Scotland. Um, and then this thing happened. Uh, mm -hmm. The thing that, that shall remain nameless. Um, and luckily, I mean, we were able to respond to it quite quickly. So we had a really good quality uh, digital capture of the piece that we'd done with the space and the roundhouse and the orange tree. So it wasn't the production we were about to tour, which was in the, sorry, it wasn't the production we were about to tour, which was end on. It was the previous version, which was in the round. Um, but what we managed to do was get that to all of our partner organizations and then do some Q and A's. So it felt like we replicated a version of the digital tour, albeit from this kitchen table right here. Um, and then that, and then that stopped uh, off at the point where the, the, the tour would have stopped in May. Mm. And since then, I guess what I've been doing, I've mainly, I've been on furlough mainly from the company, but putting my energy into other places. Uh, so quite quickly called together a group of, of black cultural leaders uh, and we meet every week on a on a Tuesday just to mm. kind of face with each other to support, share, strategize. Ultimately about, you know, ensuring that, that if there is a cultural recovery, that any ground that has been gained over the last kind yes. of 15 years doesn't start to slip back, not just for us as leaders, but also for the, the many communities and uh, groups that we represent, I guess, within the industry. Um, yeah, I have a little thing, you know, like uh, Tracy Braben, the, the shadow cultural minister, yeah. uh, I've joined a committee with her. So again, it's like, if we can't make work, can we try and ensure that when we return to work, that everybody is looked after in a slightly um, more holistic sense, maybe than they were yeah. before. Brilliant. Um, guys, as you know, you can ask questions or comment throughout the session. You do need to be subscribed to the CCI YouTube channel. So just click the subscribe button while you're clicking the like. And uh, you can ask Matthew any questions as we go through the next hour. Just know that it is a 10 to 15 second delay. So don't leave them all for the end so we don't miss anything. Um, so Matthew, start with your relationship with um, Stratford East because that goes back a really long way. Am I right in thinking you were an actor there when you were... Uh, young yeah very young so i joined the youth theater there at the age of 11. uh wow. i remember staring through the porter glass cabin that was the porter cabin <laughs> that was on the glass that was all frosted and not being able to see movement and being too scared to go in uh and going home and being sent back the next week by my mum with my pound subs in my hand and yeah here we are whatever it is 20 something years later amazing and you were um Sorry, you were associate uh, director there for a while, is that right? Yeah, so I mean, that's the place where I, I guess I was completely empowered to be an artist, mm -hmm. having arrived as a uh, attention-seeking, slightly misbehaving child. Um, but, you know, like, I, I really found a voice there. Um, mm -hmm. And I found a platform and encouragement from the artistic director and the, the people who were running the, the youth theatre, who I'm, you know, still great friends with, so... Um, Danny Braverman was the 
yeah. was running the education department at that point, and then Julia Samuels, who now runs Twenty Stories High up in Liverpool, yes, uh, yeah. was my my youth theatre leader. Um, so you know, again, like these relationships have, have continued on. Um, but so I joined at the age of eleven. By the age of sixteen, I think I'd again through connections there. Mm. Um, gone off an audition for a film for Jude Law, an audition for a film for Amanda Iannucci, which I ended up getting a part in. And yeah. I'm, like, I'm way too big for youth theatre now, uh, walking off into the distance. Um, but then kind of maintained a relationship with Stratford East. Mm. Partially as, um, so, you know, like I turned up as a, a DJ and a beat maker, um, and Philip Headley was saying, no, Matthew, you're a composer, you're a musical director. It's just that theatre isn't, operating in terms of hip hop and rap. So suddenly when they were making plays that were using those mediums, I got to, yeah. to be a musical director and a lyricist and things like that. By the time I was 18, again, Philip Headley uh, had the, the vision that he wanted young representation on the board. Mm -hmm. So I joined the board of directors at 18 and left at the age of 28. Um, I didn't say anything for the first three years. I didn't understand <laughs> Saying they're talking about finances and governance and uh, local authority relationships. I'm like, oh, I don't know what you're saying. Um, but, but you know, later on in life, that becomes really useful. Uh, yeah, amazing insight to have so young. Amazing, fantastic. Yeah. So, what was the journey from you from kind of the acting? Obviously, you had the musicianship. You've had such a broad career already between the DJing and the composing, but also being a theatre director. So, how have you? bridged all of those different um, uh, disciplines, I suppose, so evenly? How, how has that yeah. happened for you? Um, I don't know if it has been evenly. I think it comes uh, from what I call being poor uh, and therefore needing to do the things that, that paid rent and put food on the table. Yeah. Uh, that's what it was, you know, like I'm, I'm from a working class background, um, benefit class at periods for those who, who wish to use that term. Um, and so survival, I guess, is a is a key instinct. So I didn't. I dropped out of college uh, because things were starting to happening happen in the realm of DJing, uh, and I thought I can probably make this work enough to to pay mm. my rent money. Um, and then someone said, "Do you want to musically direct this thing?" I said, "What does that mean?" I said, "Well, we think it'll just be using records, and you can play underneath the poets." And I went, "Yep, yeah, I'll do that." Mm. So you start kind of accruing. Um, CV points, I guess, but what they all were, were me, and they're all expressions of me. Um, because I, I remember, I won't name him this time, I have before, uh, meeting with someone who described my CV as schizophrenic, which I took offence at. One, because it's a kind of disgusting use of uh, a medical condition. Um, but also, it's not schizophrenic, you know, it's not disconnected, it's not right. bits, it's all the same bit, which is working class brown kid from East London makes work that very often touches on all of those themes. Right. Um, I, you know, like for me playing hip hop records, that's me being a, a channel, I guess, for working class voices up and down the country. I was playing underground hip hop. So right. the voices I'm playing on my radio show were, again, working class, disenfranchised people living on housing estates around the country and around the world. Now as a theater director, I'm not doing Tom Stoppard play. Uh, I'm doing plays that feel like they speak exactly the same in terms of issues and concern, who they're for, who those communities are. Um, so weirdly, they all feel completely connected. And then I did, read a book by, what's his name? Bill Bryson called Last Night a DJ Saved My Life, which is the history of the DJ kind of thing. Um, mm. And now I'm going to be, it's going to, sound incredibly earnest and and overreaching but it's not meant to um he talks about the dj and tracing that all the way back to the shaman so if you go back to kind of early civilization uh mm -hmm. early cultures, the person who's in charge in shaping the evening's energy and for me that's what directing is and i get to rehearse it with a group of collaborators and it's also what djing is and i get no time to rehearse it i just feel the vibe and go with it in a, in a dark room yeah it's that central thing and i think you know thinking about kind of african griots uh and traditional caribbean forms of storytelling where you are literally gathered around the fire it's all that yeah in degrees i think and i love what you say about you know that a lot of this uh creativity for me has come from kind of a, a feeling of need for survival 
And I think a lot of people have found in this kind of last six months in this period that they have kind of, I hate this word because it's really corporate, but kind of pivoted, I suppose, what has been the norm for them. And that there's been this incredible creativity coming out of the industry, whether or not it's uh, been able to materialize itself commercially at this point, because we still can't for the most part, although there's been some great news the last few days, get back into theatre spaces in a way that makes it financially viable um, in, in the you know wider sense. But that people have kind of gone, well, actually, what I knew before and what the norm was, whatever, that has completely changed. And so, you know, we're seeing theatre being created on football pitches and we are seeing, you know, um, you know uh, readings online that would never have happened before and people people being more creative than I, I'm articulating but really coming up with kind of almost guerrilla theatre um, that's coming out of this real need to now think so far outside the box that we have we are forced to to re realign I think the way that we've been thinking about the industry and I think that's a really positive thing and you know I in a sense you know I think we all need the industry to come back so that we can all continue to create and be artistic and pay the bills but also that in some ways it shouldn't go back a hundred percent to the way it was what do you think about that? I think a lot of that's what people are learning about the industry isn't it that there's a massive ecology on at one end you've got Right. Ryan Max and and Sonia Friedman and kind of huge the, the, the huge commercial juggernauts mm. and at the other end you've got people who just want to express and they dance right. and they sing and they perform um, and their need to do that to express to speak to moments in time to entertain mm. is is either outweighing their need for finances right or you, you know what I mean like that's what it is the, the burning I think. That's where it always starts, isn't it? When that 11-year-old boy walking up to youth theatre didn't know that there was money to be made uh, in climbing up on that stage and, and saying rehearsed words. There was just a burning need to do it, to express. And I think, again, it's what all the baking is, you know? It's what all the, it's this kind of, I want to do something. I want to create. I want to make a thing that wasn't there before I made it. Um, hey, here's some bread. Yes, <laughs> which none of us ever want to see ever again. Um, more than bread, yeah. So, uh, tell us about your move up to Liverpool. Um, I, I don't know if you are aware, but um, James and I have had an office up there for six years and lived up there for a long time, and very passionate about regional theatre, about um, you know, particularly about the northwest because we were there for so long. So, tell us about the journey there. How do you end up from? London to Liverpool, it's, it feels like for most people a big leap, even though they're actually much closer than people realise. Yeah, yeah. And I think anyone who really wants to have a career and can do it needs to burst any centric bubbles, uh, be they London centric, right. Northern centric. The country is, you know, in the States, people work interstate, which is already bigger than the UK, whichever state it right. is. Um, my, daughter's decided she's started recording a small film. <laughs> Remind her that I'm on a film. You're the joys of working from home. I think we've all been there. Guys, if you do have any questions uh, for Matthew about anything that we're discussing today or his career, or in fact, just to chat about anything industry, make sure you click subscribe and you can ask any questions. <laughs> oh, he's going to make her movie upstairs now. Um, <laughs> so Liverpool, I was, um, I was at Stratford East. I've been there for 16 years. Uh, yeah. And it felt a little bit like I was starting to hit my head on a glass ceiling and that mm. the thing I wanted to do was direct a show by myself. And I was getting lots of co-directors and uh, co-directorships, associate directorships. Yeah. So I left there and wandered into London uh, and, and came across the Young Vic. And they had a, a series of schemes that they were operating. So the Genesis Directors Network, which is crucial. Yeah. Anyone is a director, they should be on that scheme. Um, lots of free workshops, opportunities to see work, make work. Um, and also the RTYDS. And the RTYDS is the Regional Theatre Young Director Scheme, which used to be the Channel 4 Director Scheme before that. Um, yeah. And it's about moving you around the country, I guess, giving you an understanding of, of, of different regions and locations and theatres and how they work with their, their communities. And I... <laughs> I knew that I wanted to be an artistic director, and I think quite simply what that was was I wanted to be Philip Headley. Uh, but I think that just means I'd like I wanted to be able to do for people what I felt he had done for me, which was 
give me opportunity, I guess, um, to experience art, but also to create art. Um, and so I, the very first thing I did was assist David Lan at the Young Vic on a show called Blackter. Um, yeah, when was that? 2000 and something, 12 maybe. Um, and I'd also been assisting Kerry Michael, who was also the artistic director of Stratford East. So I kind of worked out this strategy in my head that I just wanted to work very closely with artistic directors. So then I saw the RTYDS opportunity come up and applied for mm -hmm. it. Uh, my partner at the time, who is still my partner, 13 years on or whatever we are, um, uh, was from Liverpool. And I thought, oh, there's an opportunity there. We were thinking about starting a family. Uh, mm -hmm. That's why she's making movies in the corner. Um, and we thought actually, like it was, it, all, it was really logical. Uh, it felt like there was a bit more family support in Liverpool. Uh, yeah. We could reduce kind of outgoings, you know, the cost of living in Liverpool is cheaper than the cost of living in London. Yep. Um, <laughs> well, we bit the bullet and I went for a, an interview with Gemma Bodnay and we really got along uh, and I got the position. So we moved up to Liverpool for a year and a half, I think it was. Um, yeah which was wonderful. And what I really wanted to understand, I guess, was is the understanding that I have of what a cultural organization or a cultural hub is, does it replicate, you know, like the, the central principles of why a theater is a theater and how it operates with its community, right. is that the same in various places? Um, right. And ultimately, I, I think I discovered that it was, but those regions and the demographics of those regions can massively affect Yes. The output and the energy and the nature of a, a space. Um, so, yeah, and I, I got to make some work up there and I helped, uh, I was associate director on the reopening of the of the new Everyman. Yeah. Um, I went and made a film for them. So, I got, yeah, lots of little opportunities that popped up again. Um, but really got, a, again, an understanding of what it was to run two massive theatres in a, in a city. And then, so then, so the move to the exchange from there was that kind of a, a seamless transition? Did you was that specifically because you were in the north? Tell, tell us. Yeah. A bit about that. yeah, I think so. So my partner by then was working uh, at the BBC, which was in Manchester. So she was yeah. going from Liverpool to Manchester every day. Yeah. Um, the job opportunity came up, Associate Artistic Director of the Manchester Royal Exchange. I thought, oh, that's like one word more than the job title I want. If I can get that job, then I feel like I could lose the word associate for the next job. Uh, and then I've got to where I wanted to get to. Right. Um, so, I, so I applied for it, not thinking I would get it. Sarah Frankham and I had had a couple of meetings prior to that anyway. She'd seen some work of mine. Um, crucially, she'd seen Sisway Banzi is Dead, which was the show that I won the Genesis Directors Award with. Um, and I'd been very brazen with that and segregated the audience based on their ethnicity as they arrived. So if they were there was a, a bit of space, a bit of rope between it for the black audience and then on the other side for the non-black audience, and they were addressed differently throughout the piece. So it was all a bit, um, a bit provocative and dangerous in, in all the right sorts of ways. Uh, and I think she really enjoyed how I thought about theatre. What was her response to that, by the way? Uh, I think she wanted to know how it had gone down in places where maybe the theatres hadn't quite done their audience development work and therefore there weren't as many black audience members or non-white audience members. Right, right. Um, but I think she really liked it. And I think what she liked about it was, and it's something I've tried to do in lots of my work, is to not have the show start a kind of curtains up cold moment oh now it's all happening and to, for there to be something a bit more gradual um and to question the role of the audience in the piece so you're not just a passive spectator but an active spectator yeah and at which point can we activate you before anyone walks on stage um so then when i moved over there i, I was doing things like filling the, the victorian trading hall that is the royal exchange with a forest for the production of Interwood. So the audience enter the doors and then they have to walk through a forest full of bird song and the smell of real earth. Oh. And then in the middle of it, they find the big spaceship that is, is the theater and they go in there and, and have a story. Um, Blue Orange building a psychiatric, a cons consultation room underneath the stage that the audience go through because the idea was that in some way we could institutionalize them before they then came up and watched somebody essentially go through a, a mental health breakdown, which to me just felt like slightly 
icky and voyeuristic. Now, of course, there is voyeuristic, um, but there's just something about, I don't know, it, it felt uncomfortable, particularly in a play that was about ethnicity to watch a black man have a mental breakdown. And I just wanted a degree of understanding possibly to be hinted at before the audience sat down. Interesting, interesting. And you mentioned Into the Woods as well. So obviously um, there is probably a sense a little bit of there being um elitism maybe is the wrong word but certainly some segregation between you know drama musicals so how did you find working on a musical as opposed to working on a, on a drama yeah so i'd um like i said I'd come out of stratford east uh i'd done their musical writers workshop mm. four years on the trot uh i'd then written some orchestral music even though i couldn't read it uh so i wrote it in midi and then a very clever computer system printed out a score for the players to to read from and and twiddle their strings. Um, and I, and then I directed an opera at Stratford East as well for the barber. Yeah. So I had this incredible musicality, but no formal training. So again, like you know, the the people who come out of the Royal Academy of Music, for example, would be going, "Well, you shouldn't be going anywhere near a piece of music, Matthew." But luckily, Stratford East didn't have that approach, and neither did Sarah Frankham. So when I got there, she was saying. You should be operating out of your comfort zone. What have you not done? I'm like, a big musical. Uh, okay, well, you should do a big musical then. Um, and she already had a couple on the table. We looked into them. I guess I, for me, it's like here's the thing about my thinking I think it's Joan Littlewood pushed for a filter of Philip Headley, reprogrammed for 2020 or something like that. Um, so I'm always going, who's it for? Who's not coming? Why are they not coming? How can we get them in? How can we make them feel comfortable? Right. Um, right. Every single point. Because uh, I don't think theatre's for people like me. You know, I did lots of the theatres I go into still now, even as a kind of senior leader, a leader in the industry, mm. I still feel like I'm not wanted in particular spaces. Um, and I want to break down as many of those barriers as possible. So I said, okay. Let's set it in Manchester now. Uh, let it look like the high street as much as possible. We already know that the moment we see a red duffel coat, boom, we download the whole story. We know what that is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it doesn't have to be a kind of, uh, you know, a Quentin Blake illustration of a little freckled girl with pigtails. Right. Uh, it could be someone from, from the city who has wandered out into orderly edge and discovered a fight, you know it's like uh -huh. that's what we were playing with and an orderly edge we discovered had loads of folklore and magic and mystery around it yeah. um, and so that's where we said it and and it felt every day you know our wolf was a version of russell brand with a slightly questionable uh kind of mod look to him so he had a kind of rain mac uh on at certain points and then when he took it off he was completely naked apart from his wolf skin uh cod piece and mm -hmm. his tail and, and then his big medallion that had a wolf's uh tooth on the end of it um amazing and that this was of course before russell brown had been cured of his whatever it was um attraction to many people yeah um so again like just looking for contemporary references that meant that if you walked in and you were a kind of 15 year old inner city kid, it was already speaking your language. You spoke its language. There was no high art, low art division. Amazing, amazing. And um, great, so from there, so the, tell us about, about ATC, tell us about Actors Touring Company. Um, yeah, so, so I'm working towards losing the associate from the associate artistic director job title, uh, meant that in 2016, I think it was when I left maybe 17, maybe 18, 18. When I left the Royal Exchange, um, 14, 17, 2017, um, I, I applied for lots and lots and lots of jobs uh, to be an artistic director. And I guess the important thing about that is you, that you don't want to present a vision or an idea that isn't you. Um, so you're looking for that match. So you keep knocking on doors with your bag of tricks going, look, this is what I got. And eventually you'll find one that's a match or, or that's what I was hoping. Mm. I guess weirdly, I didn't expect it to be ATC um, because of their internationalism and my up until that point kind of lack of internationalism. Right. 
But again, once I started looking at what their principles were and how that internationalism had arrived, it seemed like it had arrived by being interested in in a kind of global identity or, or the cultures of the world. Mm. Um, and I thought, oh, that is what I am, but I'm interested in the ones that are here in the UK and how they make the UK by being glorious and many. Um, I went for the job interview. Uh, I presented what I thought was a um, kind of compelling case about cross-cultural intersectional work, mm. um, about finding the voices that lots of other people aren't commissioning or, or platforming and amplifying those. Um, and now I'm, I'm in positions. I've been there for two years. Mm. The first piece we did uh, was a play called Amsterdam uh, by a Israeli writer writing about her experience of living in in Europe, I guess, but in Amsterdam and what it was as someone who was, you know, the child of Holocaust survivors to walk around in a place where that had been enacted in in a in a completely barbaric way. Um, but the complexity of Amsterdam's history in that it's this kind of liberal, uh, turn the other cheek, look the other way, kind of, you know, the thing that we got onto, I guess, was that Anne Frank became the poster girl for mm. for the Dutch Jewish experience through the Holocaust. Um, and of course she was hidden away, but she didn't survive because someone ratted them out, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and so what is it as a Jewish woman who presents as a foreigner to walk around with that history around you as well and ultimately to not feel like it's possible to stay there. Um, it was an unusual piece formally uh, and for me that felt like trying to meet ATC where it was which is, was that the work that it had done was often post-traumatic, um, quite expressionistic, not necessarily kind of um, kitchen sink dramas or naturalism. Mm -hmm. So I guess I grabbed all the themes that I was interested in and maybe some of the form that ATC had already established and smushed them together to make the first piece. Uh, since then, uh, I went on a panel for Act for Change and people were talking about how you can make serious change, how we can change the canon, uh, and being as bold and provocative as I often attempt to be, I said something like, well, people should just commission women of color, shouldn't they? Uh, then you read the headline the following day on the stage. Yes, yeah. yeah. Commissioning women of color exclusively for the next three years. So I go back to Andrew, who's the executive director of ATC, and I say, that's policy now, Andrew. That's what we're doing. Right. Um, which is like, it's what we've been saying in the office to ourselves anyway. Like, you know, why don't we talk to this group of people, why don't we see what stories these guys have got bubbling mm -hmm. away? Um, but then you find yourself speaking in front of those who can write headlines and it <laughs> quite quickly moves from being an uh, unofficial policy to a concrete policy. It's, it's brilliant. I remember when that came out, I remember reading it in the stage thinking that is a, an incredibly kind of bold and progressive way to be moving forward. And how's it been going? I mean, obviously there's been a break at the moment. But, yeah, there has been a break, but there's not been a break in commissioning, I guess. So that's the thing that right. I felt like if there's anything we can do artistically, we can pay people to make work that could be delivered later on at some other right. point. Uh, so there's one that I can't yet mention because uh, they haven't yet signed the contract, but we sent it to them just a week ago. And I'm uh, that's a co-commission uh, with the Young Vic that I'm really excited about. Um, it's also, I mean, lots, you know, I was talking to someone, I hadn't even realised this. But it's not a new writer. And I think lots of people are, are just on like the hunt for the the brilliant 24 year old, you know, the, yeah. the, the genius wunderkind that exists out there. Um, but actually there are so many great talented writers who have been writing for 20 years in this country. Uh, and I got talking to, to one of them and we sparked an idea. Um, and so, and, and then, you know, so now it comes with the caveats. Could you write it for a flexible space? Could you write it maybe for the outdoors? What about uh, sports halls or, you know? Right. So right. we're now trying to put that into it. Uh, the work that we commissioned prior to that, um, I think is already out there in the, in the public domain in terms of knowledge about it. So Nasa Murti is writing me a, um, God, I hope it's gonna be full of hope. But it's about, I guess, radicalization, online radicalization of, of young white 
boys uh, and the intersection with um, misogyny uh, and the incel culture and incel movement. I don't want to talk about the cases that have come up, but you know, the majority of, of violent acts that have happened in the States, for example, have been right. that, that demographic. Um, but also like the intersection of that with loneliness and how you need the vulnerability and loneliness of an individual who feels separate from society to capitalize on their right. vulnerable thinking and lead them down this pathway. Then it leaps into this realm of like culture wars, which we're experiencing at the moment, but how that is essentially a transference from online culture wars mm. and the manipulation of those into the real space. So I think it's about a boy who falls into the internet and gets mm -hmm. corrupt. I think that's what it's about. Um, and then Yasmin Joseph is writing something for, for us and Soho Theatre, which we think, uh, who knows what it will be end up being about. It's early days, but currently it's kind of looking at, or, or triggered by an experience that, that she had whilst being away on holiday as an individual black woman, and suddenly just being aware of constantly being observed uh, I think it was when she got home and had some pictures developed or something like that. That sounds incredibly 90s, doesn't it? Had some pictures developed. Uh, probably when she got the, the phone back off, the waiter who had taken the Yeah, picture. I was going to um, say. Yeah, she looked at it and realised every other person was craning over to look at who this woman was and why she was there and, well, why is she alone and what's going on? So I guess about, like, travelling whilst black is what that's about. Um, at the moment, could become anything. I guess what I'm finding, it's all that, that big fear that everybody has, the risk of racialized stories. Mm. Um, thinking back to Gavin Henderson, talking about why he wouldn't you know, increase the number of black students at Central, was because he didn't want to lower excellence or something like that, which some, is- Some, yeah, some- Yeah, compromise. Yeah, compromise, right. Compromise, right. Compromise excellence. Uh, which implies that you're lowering standards. Every single writer I'm talking to is a genius who can right. make them the biggest and best stages all around the world. Um, so I think that's what I'm finding. It's not been difficult to go out there. I'm, I'm uh, like many. I'm going well. Which one do we commission? Is it that story? Is it that story? Is it that story? I'm overwhelmed by the amount of incredible writers and stories that exist. Um, so yeah, I, I'm trying to do that thing that I've always said I would do if I was running somewhere, which is walk the walk uh, and do it. Just touching kind of on, um, I suppose, inclusivity and diversity within the industry. I mean, we've been incredibly lucky as casting directors that we have almost, I think, in the last six years, always worked with um, directors and producers who wanted to see representation on stage and obviously working on shows like Six, which are so strong in their voice of kind of representation is the best word in terms, not just in terms of um, racial representation, but body type in terms of, you know, background, look, everything. Um, so we've been very, very lucky with that. But I think this whole, uh, the whole BLM movement over the, um, the summer and all of the issues that have happened, and it's not not just in America it is it's very much here and it's very ingrained um uh, I think in, in in British culture unfortunately but I think it has made people like us very aware that you know we have a responsibility as casting directors but also you I think some of the conversations have come out that made you you one realize that being aware isn't enough that we have to be all you know doing more um, so, you know, for people out there who perhaps are starting to create or produce or direct their own work, what, what's your advice for them in terms of, you know, ensuring that they are, you know, doing more than being aware? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, like points of proactivity. That's it. Um, yeah, I guess it's this idea that, that it's no good just not being a racist, you have to be an anti-racist. Right. No uh, right. not being misogynist you have to be a feminist it's all of right. those things isn't it like yeah right for a better world i think um mm -hmm. there are some real simple things that i often think about uh one and this only came to me during lockdown so it's not even something that i'd been able to put into practice or maybe i was putting it into practice but without having um identified it no one dominant group right in the room 
look around a space, look around the office. Mm. Is there a dominant group? And you should be looking across all the protected characteristics. Right. Uh, and then you should be asking, is there a reason for the one dominant group? If, mm. for example, you're clean break and you're working with uh, victims, sorry, survivors of domestic abuse, um, uh, vulnerable women, yeah. and it's important that there are no men in that space, then you go, cool, there is a dominant group, they are female. Yeah. Now let's investigate that group. Are yeah. they all the same colour? Are they all from the same uh, financial bracket? Are they mm -hmm. all the same religion? Are they, you know, it's, and again, just try, and then the other real simple thing, which is looking at this from the other end, is put the high street in everywhere. Put right. the high street in everywhere. Right. Um, when I walked from uh, Piccadilly Station in Manchester down to the Royal Exchange, mm. or the whole world. Yes. Through, the entire world, but everything. Um, and then I walked through these swinging glass doors into this rarefied world where that was all reduced and only certain types of people could be in this space. Mm. I kind of want to blow those doors off their hinges and let the high street leak into every space, every office, every production, every creative team. So they're the two things I try and hold on to. Um, the other thing is, when do you need a degree of cultural specificity within something, right? Uh, a particular no knowledge, a particular lived experience that's yeah. going to help you to have um, making making the piece I've just made, for example, uh, eight four six live, which was a, I guess, a Black British response to the murder of George Floyd. Mm. Uh, it was entirely a Black company, but also Black mixed race. Uh, it was an entirely black creative team uh, and me being black mixed race. And then there was a white stage manager um, who gets it because it wasn't exclusionary. And it was never meant to be exclusionary. But it was about, again, if we're being asked to dredge up our own personal trauma and stick it in front mm -hmm. of an audience, so, right. um, then we should be able to do that collectively. For the first time ever, we worked. I worked with a drama therapist in the rehearsal room to make sure that we were all safe at all points and that we weren't damaging ourselves to make this work and I came out of it going you know what I want a drama therapist in every single room I ever work in because whether it's race-based ethnicity-based trauma or we're looking at abuse or we're looking at poverty we're very often churning some some deep mm. and dark waters mm. and I'm not skilled I'm skilled to tell people where to stand on stage and, and how to in a line so that it makes sense and we get it and and when that sound cue can come in um and to get an actor to that point but i'm not skilled with the fallout of no, no dredging not, up no. Um, traumatic experiences or even skirting near to them no i don't think many of us are i think it's been very interesting actually running um cci and having lots of these kind of discussions with different people across the industry creatives and actors producers agents and um we had a particular um q a where um an actor we know very well actually came on and commented asked some questions and said she felt like there was um a lot of tokenism in the industry she's a mixed race actor you know she's worked a lot and has you know obviously uh, been very successful in the areas that she's wanted to work in and said she felt you know she saw things on breakdowns like you know we are looking for all ethnicities and kind of thought well you know I'm going to be that person that turns up and then I'm going to see the cast and see that it's a fully white cast and this was really kind of shocking to, especially I think to us because we've always really prided ourselves on really working hard to make sure there was real inclusivity in all of our cast you know she wasn't specifically talking about you know us as casting directors but just the industry in general I think it's really opened my eyes to people maybe feeling that you know they don't have a voice feeling marginalized in in you know in a in a community in the arts you you know there's an assumption that you can be yourself and there's a level of acceptance for who you are and I think that really has opened our eyes along with um you know wanting to um you know when we're running this platform bring in um you know uh, lots of different creatives from different backgrounds and you know different experiences and realizing how few creatives of color there are in commercial theater yeah. so why do you think that is why is it such a predominantly white area of the industry because obviously you, you know you have specific um you know theater groups which kind of you know have their own uh, history and heritage within that and so mm -hmm. but in terms of commercial theater there are very very few 
ethnic minority creatives. And, and the actors who have spoken to us have said they find that very prohibitive. They feel they're going into a room where maybe they don't have any kind of um, support, yeah. interestingly, which I think, you know, needs to be addressed. So do you, do you have any thoughts on why this is kind of evolved in this way? Uh, I do. It's a big scary word that lots of people walk away from, but it's it's white supremacy. But I don't mean that in terms of the KKK riding into town on horseback. Mm. Uh, I just mean a kind of dominant way of thinking about about where importance lies across different demographics. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the people that are running and leading those big commercial companies, they very often hire in their own image which is a thing we we all very often do that so we have to be aware of hiring in our own image uh the stories that naturally they gravitate towards or they look at or they are interested in are ones that kind of reflect their own life experiences again mm. like it's not meant i don't think it's like this intentional desire no to exclude and to just replicate and replicate and replicate but it's just that people don't look up enough you know they mm. They look down into their own world. Um, so we get examples of people making work about other cultural groups, but not including those cultural groups in the making of the work, right. for example. Uh, yeah. um, and then we just have to question that and we go, that's not right. Um, and it stems all the way back down, you know, if, if again, if the, if the drama schools are saying, well, we're only going to take two or three students of this group per year as a quota, how many of those survive to become... Right. 50 year old multimillionaires who are running <laughs> commercial theater organization. Not, right. None is the answer ultimately. Um, I think the change may start to happen. I think we start to see things. It's this idea that, again, racialized risk, and I think would give more of us a chance. Mm. And we'll dazzle and entertain, <laughs> you know, like, like we have been doing for 400 years and beyond, going back way be beyond you know imperialism and colonization um but i think that is it and i'm really looking forward to you know uh clint dyer directing the bob marley story yes, like, yes. Oh, that's going to be right fantastic. um great right appointment exactly and the trust i think that's what it's about you know ultimately yeah. it's about financial trust and people go i don't know this person so you just replicate, you know, the reason that Dominic Cook was going to do that, of course, is because he's brilliant at doing musicals. Right. You know, he can do amazing musicals. He is not a risk in the staging of musicals. Give him the Bob Marley show. And of course, I don't know, I imagine Dominic would be thinking long and hard about taking it and then he'd be looking at his, I don't know, bank balance and going, yeah, actually, I need to take that job this year. I'm going to do it. Um, but this, again, has just opened up thinking so that people look up and suddenly they look up and they go, maybe that's not the right decision. Mm. Who else is there? I remember, I think it, I can't remember who it was, some senior director sat on stage at the Olivier uh, next to another senior black director saying, you know, something like, there just aren't any directors who could make work for a stage of this size. And I was thinking, the person sat next to you can you just have never trusted them to do that. Um, mm. and, it, and it takes Mavericks, it takes the Sarah Franken to spot someone like me and go, Matthew, you never made a musical before, a big, massive musical. You could lose us 25 grand a night on this one, but here you go, have it, do it. And then I get better, don't I, right? I'm, I do it and I learn from doing it. Right. And hopefully, no matter what that musical is, the next one should be better. <laughs> Right, and it paid off this time. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. And I think there were enough people, I hope there are now enough people that are starting to go, the amount of melanin in one skin is not a risk to their ability to make a piece of theatre. No. Nayara says, how has your experience in working in different areas of this industry assisted you as an artistic director? Yeah. Um, I think in like subtle and and quiet ways is how I often think about it. So I'm I'm very rarely thinking about the musicality of a piece of theater, but of course musicality is like, sometimes a line might be said a number of times and, I'm, and the rhythm of it just isn't quite right to my ear, which is trying to hear a melody or something or the way someone hands over to another character. Um, so I think in, in making work, 
I'm massively influenced by musicality. Also my love of like illusion and magic. So I'm a big fan of a surprise uh, in any piece of work. Um, I think, again, like, you know, like when I go, when I'm DJing in a club, again, there's kind of everyone in that club. Uh, and I'm really interested in how we make the theatrical audience feel more like that. Right. But, um, yeah, just I mean, like the very first, one of the very first pieces I made was essentially a hip hop concert. We took an old Rodgers and Hart musical and restaged it as a as a hip hop concert with crash barriers and security on the door and uh, the doors left open so you could go to the bar at any point and everyone standing took out all the seats in the auditorium. I always, yeah, I guess it's that thing about wanting to bring work to people on their on their terms, not wanting them to adapt to come to us. Right. Uh, which again is an echo of, of hip hop, I think. I think that's a big thing for me, like hip hop sensibility, which brings me uh, a degree of radicalism, uh, a, a slight distrust of authority. <laughs> um, <laughs> a fashion sense, a vibe, a swagger, whatever it is. I think that exists in in lots of how I want to be in spaces, the way I, I want to take up space, I think, um, and be uncompromising. I think the background of being a swagtastic hip hop DJ means that you suddenly find yourself constrained by some of the expectations of how you should behave in theatrical spaces. So just trying to push for that. Um, we worked on a fab piece um, last year um, called Club Mex, which was produced by Global Musicals up at the Hope Mill in Manchester. And we've worked a lot actually with uh, work up there, which we just love working on new writing, new pieces. And um, Global is uh, the commercial side of per uh, Perfect Pitch, where they take a lot of new British writing and, and workshop yeah. that. And they do absolutely brilliant stuff there. Also, uh, Global, uh, the um, partly produced six, sorry. Um, yeah. And their show uh, is basically set in a nightclub setting and is about some teens who go away or, or abroad, whatever. And we stood, the whole thing was run on a catwalk and the audience stood for an hour and 15 minutes. And I, you know, I think they were a bit like, you know, have to sit. but it brought in this younger audience who probably wouldn't necessarily go and sit through, you know, three hours broken up with an interval of something, you know, a revival of something that's been done. And um, it was just something that the, um, the soundtrack itself could have just been, you know, a club, club it was all club music. Yeah. And it just really was, it felt really kind of fresh just to do something different. And we all just stood with a beer and glow sticks and it was just so much, I they're looking to do other things with that. But it, it's that thing about just taking it out of the traditional setting and it took a people a beat to kind of go, oh, there's nowhere to sit. We just stand as if we're in this nightclub. And it was just really, it was brilliant. And yeah, love it. Um, Yasmin says, I'm really hoping Soho Theatre opening a wall from so allows more opportunities for diverse stories and talent. Me too. Now that theatre is uh, my childhood cinema. It's where I first saw Home Alone at the age uh -huh. of or something like that. Um, <laughs> and then it became a, a various points of church, a mosque, a bingo hall. Uh, wow in an empty disused space and so to see it also i think waltham forest is one of the few spaces one of the few boroughs that doesn't kind of have a central i, th I don't think it has a theater but i'm not sure it has a, a mass cultural space really other than the like william morris mm -hmm. gallery in lloyd's park so that would be amazing it's again it's, it's a huge diverse area spread across mm -hmm. you know four or five different bits of, of london really um so that would be amazing, yeah, if it, if it can draw upon that community that already exists there and, and keep that. What Joan Littlewood called the continuous cycle, take community relevant stories, put them on stage for the community who will then in turn develop more stories, more voices for you. Um, Matthew, we've only got five minutes left, unbelievably. The hour has kind of whizzed by. And you are back with us um, very uh, shortly with some another session. I think you're work, doing some text-based uh, work for us, uh, which yeah. we're really looking forward to. It'd be brilliant. Um, so, guys, if you have any more questions, now is the time. But I just want to talk briefly. Obviously, um, things are starting to move and shift, and it's you know great news. People are starting to find workarounds for socially distanced theatre, and there's all kinds of things going on over the next few months which is very exciting but you know it hasn't fully opened back up and it has been a difficult time for 
performers and creatives alike, particularly for new grads? Do you have any advice for someone who's well, not just coming out now into the industry, but actually entering their third year um, at college. We have a lot of people right, saying, you know, should I defer my year? I'm feeling a little bit insecure about what's going to be happening in the industry. So do you have any kind of thoughts uh, or advice for those people? I kind of have. Uh, I'm trying to think of the best way to put it. Uh, brace yourselves. Strap in. Don't give up. Find mm -hmm other ways of sustaining yourself financially, keep yourself creatively nourished, don't defer your training, finish your course. We will get back to making work. And we, like you say, we are starting to find ways of getting back to making work. Mm -hmm. um, my big approach for anyone who feels like they're shut out or they can't find a way in or, or opportunity is less is spikely. Do it yourself. Make a thing separate to the thing. Build your own version of it. Um, the, the, you know, I don't need to tell people this, but the, the things that we can do with technology in terms of making short films now, shot on an iPhone with a little extra lens stuck on the front of it, mm. edit on whatever the free software is that comes, you know, like people can really achieve high quality creative output. So I think it's that. And going back to what we were talking about earlier, just that desire to make and to create. Just try and sustain that. Um, because I always think about the people I've seen who have been in the industry and for a number of reasons have, have stepped away from it, nearly always a financial reason. Mm. Um, and then within three years, four years time, they're feeling in an even worse place because they have the finance, but they don't have the fire in them anymore that yeah. excited them and made them keen to get up in the morning. So who was I talking to? I was we're talking to a graduate who was working as an intern at ATC. Um, and she was saying she's just got a job in a kind of, I think it's to do with culture, but within the local authority, back home in Bristol, I'm saying just go and do that for now. Do that for two years, pay the bills. I mean, if you've got to be a barista, whatever it is, like most graduates have to be a barista, you know? Right. Like, go and do the bar work, yeah. copy work, whatever it is, but don't give up. That's, that's my big piece of advice. Um, Great advice. And know that everyone else, all these creatives, all these producers and directors and choreographers are all, no one is sitting back waiting for everything to happen. Everyone is working as creatively and furiously as they can to try and get, sorry, I'm not crying. I've got something in my eye. Um, to try and get the industry um, back up and get it going as soon as possible. And we're going to need every bit of talent that's out there to be ready to, jump straight back in and and you know there'll be new writing and there'll be new theatre and there'll be new experiences and we need the industry fresh and diverse and alive and ready to go and so yeah. that I think just following on from what you're saying that's really important just um briefly in terms of like actors you know and your your um casting process what are you looking for from an actor in the audition room uh in kindness uh is key and every, now, I got it wrong once, and every single uh, team I have, always at the end of it, they're like, this has been a really lovely process, hasn't it? Like, I've not been able to spot the, the bad energy in the room. Why is that not here? And I'm like, because I don't have it anymore. Yeah. It derails the process. It makes it not fun. And I think half the reason I'm in this gig is because I want to have fun in my job and, and right. work. Um and collaboration, how can you collaborate? So kindness is key. And I always say kindness over talent. And I know there are some directors who will very happily take talent over kindness and celebrate that particular energy and to the detriment of everyone else. Uh, and I'm not up for that. Uh, so that talk that we do at the start, where we ask you about your life or how your journey was or yeah. what you've been doing for the last six months or how you got through lockdown, for me is genuine. Because uh, I want to know if we can talk, can we get along, mm. can we have a chat about little things and big things and everything in between. So that's kind of part one. For me, part two is I want you to have all the ideas. That's your job as the actor. Generate ideas, look at the text, throw me some stuff, because my job is uh, curatorial, I think. So the actor, you know, we all generate and stir the big pot at the start, but then it's up to you to look after that particular character. And I don't want to have to do that. I want to be looking after the big thing and curating choices from everybody 
to make the theme. Um, so that's the second bit. And then the third bit is adaptability. Mm. If you generate a thing and the thing I do not like and the thing I, uh, doesn't fit in the world or I just simply say no, generate a new thing quickly, a different thing. And again, and again, and again, be able to do that. I think that's what the rehearsal process is. So I want to find that as quickly as possible in the casting uh, before we get there. Brilliant. And have real ideas. You know, when people come in and you say, um, what did you think of the character? And they're like, they haven't really got ideas. Mm. Um, it, it's so genuine. I'm comparing, I am honestly comparing what you say about what you think the character is going to do and how we're going to spend those four weeks with the person who just sat in front of you and had 16 different ideas or really struggled with a part of their character's journey and didn't quite know how they were going to get through that and, and was, you know, were thinking about that. Right. Um, don't come as the character. Don't come carrying the autobiography of the character, trying to trick me that you've been reading it for the last four weeks. <laughs> um, I don't need any of that. I just need you to read the play. <laughs> and be interested in it as well. And I can sniff right. out the, the, the lies, I guess. Um, you know, like, it, I often do political theatre. Uh, or, or even if I'm not, there are politics mixed in there somewhere. Yeah. Uh, be it in in how it represents the world on stage, uh, mm -hmm. in a story of Sleeping Beauty, for example, uh, or the fact that the fairies in Sleeping Beauty were all non-binary fairies, um, which was glorious. But I'm going to want to talk about that sort of thing in the room. Um, so yeah, don't don't just like you can't just jump on the on that and if it's not real, I guess. Yeah, uh, yeah it's got to be authentic for me. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Matthew, we're out of time. Thank you so much for an amazing hour. I know people will uh, be incredibly grateful for you sharing your knowledge and amazing experience in the industry. We have you back for uh, a uh, contextual analysis session in a couple of weeks. So yeah. we'll see you back then. Which sounds really, really heavy, doesn't it? Um, but it's not. <laughs> it's, just, it's just like looking at the words and working out what's going on underneath them and some tips and tricks for how to do that and, and where the space might be to play within that. Love that. Uh, thank you so much. Just hang out in the studio for a second. I'm going to take you out to the live stream and just talk a little bit about the last session of the day. Um, Naira says thank you. I know lots of people watching will say thank you um, as we sign off. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, guys, coming up, we have the last session of the day. We have the lovely Jessica Paul. She is back with a self-love and manifestation workshop. So don't miss that at 4.45. That is our last session today. If you enjoyed any of the sessions and practitioners we had on today, make sure you are on social media. We are at CCI2020 on Twitter and at Collective Creative Initiative on Instagram with the hashtag CCI2020. Uh, and make sure you are giving all the videos a like as we go.